everyone, and welcome back to another edition of the Data Idols and Data Science Festival Summer School. I'm Jess, the Community Director of the Data Science Festival, and I'll be your host for this event. So this event is part of a three-part mini-series of Intro to Machine Learning, and today we'll be covering regression. There's two more sessions, which are classification and clustering, so if you have time to check out the other two, please do so, as I'm sure they'll be excellent. So today there's a couple of options. If you're watching it live, please make sure you check out in the chat, there'll be a link to our Slack channel. If you wanna join that, you can chat to other attendees, ask questions about the summer school, and of course, we're there to help you. If you're watching this on playback, congratulations on making it this far, and hopefully you're enjoying all the sessions that the summer school has to offer. So before we get started, I just wanted to say a massive thank you to our partners. They have spent a lot of time putting all this content together, rehearsing, recording, and now being a part of the summer school. So we're really grateful to every single company that's taken part in this year's event. So one of those partners is the lovely people at Compass Lexicon who are running today's session. So we've got Victor and Antoine from Compass Lexicon, and they're going to be covering regression, intro to machine learning. So enjoy. <music> We are Antoine and Victor from Compass Lexicon. We are very happy uh, to join the Data Science Festival Summer School of 2021. Uh, we are very happy to meet you, even though meeting you means only being in front of our computer. And today we will present an introduction to machine learning session focusing on regression. And he, we hope it will be interesting uh, to you. So in terms of content, the presentation will unfold as follows. So we will start obviously with a quick introduction. We'll try to make it as quick as possible of both uh, ourselves and Compass Lexicon, so the company we work for. Then we want to take a step back before deep diving into regression analysis and share a few comments on the prediction versus inference discussion, which we believe is quite interesting uh, for the case of today. Then we'll dive in. So we'll show and we'll explain to you what is linear regression and most importantly, how we apply it to our business life. So our day-to-day -day life as economists within Compass Lexicon. We, we will also show you some regression results and we'll talk you through the way we, we interpret those results. And lastly, we'll have a last slide with some concluding remarks. So first, who we are. Uh, so as I said, we are Antoine and Victor. So starting with myself, which is rude, sorry for that, Victor. So my name is Antoine Victoria. I'm a vice president within Compass Lexicon. I work both in the competition team and the data science team. And prior to Compass Lexicon, I work within a data science and AI consultancy. And here, my, my job was mostly to optimize for companies such as uh, Orange and Renault, so French companies, optimize their media uh, spending. So make sure they have the most impact based on econometric modeling and data science. So hi everyone, uh, I'm Vector. Uh, I'm pretty new joiner to Compass Lexicon. So I joined Compass uh, this year as a data scientist, but uh, I'm, my background is actually economics. So I also have some experience in economic consulting, uh, but right now working for the data science team, we are trying to uh, apply more machine learning and more advanced techniques into our day-to-day -day life at uh, economic consulting. So yeah, uh, I think we can say a few words yes. about Compass Lexicon. Yes, uh, so we are not the only data science uh, team members who have a presentation on this data science festival. So maybe you already seen, uh, you have already seen the, this slide, but in, in short, who we are? We are economists, or at least we used to be only economists. Now we are economists and econometricians, and now most recently economists, econometricians, and data scientists. And what we do is we work on some particular projects, which we call cases, that are all competition related. So for instance, we work on big merger cases, and also, and that will be our focus of today on cartel uh, cases. We work for companies, obviously, but we, we also work 
with or for uh, law firms, uh, because all these cases have a legal um, have a legal side. And what we do basically, and it's on the bottom right of the slide, is we apply economics theory. So we will talk uh, to you about economics theory in more details in the next slide. And we use that economic theory to produce compelling empirical evidence. So empirical evidence, and here we are going to talk about regression, is uh, what we deliver to our clients. Okay, so that's all for the quick introduction. And then maybe we can start with the few words on prediction uh, versus inference, which we, which we believe is a um, relevant um, introduction for the regression presentation. So what is statistical learning? It's a rather complex word to explain something which is actually quite simple. So in our business life, but it's applied to many businesses as, I, as we will explain, we often observe some inputs or what we can also um, uh, explain as independent variables that we call x in that slide and these inputs they have an impact on an output uh, that we name y in that slide and there is or at least we assume there is a relationship between the input here that would be the costs so on the x axis of this graph and the output here being the price. So typically here, and this is, you know, economics 101, we assume that there is a relationship between cost and price, supposedly a positive relationship, meaning that the higher the cost, the higher the price. And that, that relationship, we can write it as the following. It's uh, a functional form by which X impacts uh, Y. And essentially, statistical learning refers to many approaches we can implement for estimating that F uh, function. The statistical learning uh, approach has various applications uh, in the business life. So maybe starting by stuff other than economic consulting, uh, if you think about marketing, uh, and I talked about that a bit when I presented myself, you can use statistical learning to optimize advertising spending. So here the X is media spending, the Y is the sales of the company. And what, we, what you want to do is to it estimate the incremental impact of media spending on sales. It's the same for business operations. So typically, you can use statistical learning to predict the demand of a particular product. Taking the example of Amazon and the big warehouses of Amazon, for Amazon to decide which space in the warehouse they should dedicate to a given SKU, to a given product, it's essential for them to be able to predict the demand for that particular product. So that's for marketing and business operations. Here, we will not focus on that today because this is not what we do in our day-to-day -day, day -day life. We will focus on economic consulting. And again, the, the business case we are going to talk you through is the, estimate, uh, the estimation of the price overcharge due to cartel practices. So before even going to the example, uh, so when talking about statistical learning, there are usually two main reasons why we want to estimate the F, so the functional form. So one of the such reasons could be a prediction. So uh, we would like to predict some, uh, some Y given some input variables. And usually uh, the prediction uh, is very useful when why so our the, the variable that we're interested in uh, in predicting is not so easy to uh, to collect so it can be in the future since we cannot uh, observe future currently or uh, it can be uh, variables uh, such as uh, patient risk of uh, effect of patient uh, given some some drug so we cannot we don't know how patient would react on a drug yet given our current observations, but we try, we can try to predict it using his blood samples or his current health status. So this is a prediction and uh, uh, in a prediction, so we usually take the inputs, so our Y and try to, uh, try to model our response var variable. And we estimate, uh, we can, uh, estimate the, the relationship between our inputs and our output in some functional form and uh, calculate our prediction and then evaluate it. So why it is important, uh, what's important to understand in a prediction is that 
uh, there are two types of error uh, we can make in a prediction. One type of error is reducible because it's due to our method or our statistical method we are taking and we can improve our method by using different methods or just improving the method uh, overall using more explanatory variables. But there is also irreducible error, which is due to the fact that we actually cannot see the, uh, our outcome variable. So and this is where we cannot perfectly fit our model. So this would be the prediction. And the second part would be, uh, the second reason would be actually the inference. So we might not necessarily be interested uh, in making predictions about our response or our, about our why, but we would actually like to understand how different inputs affect our outcome variable. And this is what we usually interested in in economic consulting. So we try to model the relationship between different variables to explain to us uh, and um, make it easier for us to understand uh, like what we observe uh, in uh, real life. So having understood that there are two main reasons, uh, we might now ask how we can make those predictions or those inferences. So there are usually two methods uh, that we can distinguish. So one is called parametric or actually like model-based approach, which is something frequently seen in economics. So at the very first step, we make a certain assumption, which allows us to simplify the problem a bit. So we make an assumption about some functional form so that there is certain relationship between inputs and outputs. And this, this allows us to simplify the problem and then using the historical data or the data that we have, we train our model and uh, evaluate our prediction. And as you can see here on a, on a graph, we made an assumption about the functional form that there is actually linear relationship between our variables. So we can fit this nice plane and uh, try to evaluate how good our model is in predicting price using cost and quantity. On the other hand, there is also a non parametric approach, uh, which basically makes does not make this uh, uh, initial assumption. And it's much more flexible when it comes to estimating the, uh, in this example, price or our outcome variable. Like the difficulty here is that we, in the non-parametric approach, we need large number of observations or the, our explanatory variables to make it very uh, flexible. So sometimes it's easier or given our data to make this functional form assumption to simplify our problem and work with good enough model to, uh, to make inferences or predictions. So now going to that point, when do we care actually more about inference and prediction? Yes, many thanks, Victor. And typically, so our business case, the estimation of a cartel effect on prices, it typ is typically one case in which we would like to go more with inference than prediction. And so again, for the, the reason for that is, is the following. When we work on the cartel case, the, the competition authorities, so the CMA in the UK, the European Commission in Europe, for instance, they, they found some evidence that companies discussed together and in the worst case scenario, agreed together to increase uh, the, the, the prices of their products. So basically the question we are asked here is the following. Can you put together a model, backward-looking model? So it's not, it's not a prediction model. It's not forward-looking. So can you set up a model and tell me what are the factors that influence the price dynamic? And more precisely, can you estimate an effect, either positive, negative, or null, of the cartel practices on prices? So the way I frame this, this problem, this, this question to us, makes it pretty clear that we want to go uh, with inference. Why so? Because we need something that is interpretable. The, the, key, uh, the key issue here is to be able to estimate the incremental impact of all factors influencing prices, but most importantly, the impact of the, the, the practices on the damage to, to, to the economy, which would be an increase of prices. So, this is the case in economic consulting. It's also the case in other, um, in other industry. So again, um, uh, marketing, for instance. But here, um, to, to sum it up, 
we want to have something which is fully interpretable because this is the question we are asked to. And so this is why we choose the inference approach. Okay, so I hope this short introduction to prediction and inference, even if it's a bit maybe theoretical, was interesting to you. Now, what we suggest to do is that we get uh, in the core of the subject, which is linear regression, one, you know, as a matter of principle, but maybe two, most importantly, the way we apply it uh, within compass lexicon. And so taking again the example of cartel traces. So as I said, this is our day-to-day -day business life. So we are asked by, comp by competition authorities and by companies, the clients we work for, to estimate the alleged, damage, the alleged uh, damages of cartel cases. So what we need to do again, is we need to understand the price dynamic. And we do so by, um, by assuming a functional form that could, that, that could look uh, like the equation we display on the slide. So on that equation, what do you have? You have the, the output, which is P, the price of the product. And we assume, I mean, based again on economic theory, that the, the price dynamic is influenced by one, the variable C, which is the variable costs. And that's pretty, that's pretty obvious. Also by Q, the quantity demanded. So there is an assumption that the, the higher the quantity, the quantity the higher the price. And, and X the product character characteristics. Because if you work with a set of data covering uh, several years, it's important to account for the evolution of the product characteristic. Taking here the example of, say, the iPhone smartphone, if you want to estimate the, the effects on prices of, uh, for the iPhone, you need to take into account product characteristics because obviously the iPhone become more and more sophisticated as time, uh, as time goes. And basically what we want to do here is we want to estimate the value of each coefficient, so each beta coefficient, which each measure the, incremel, the incremental impact of each variable. And we do so by putting together that functional form and running uh, a regression analysis on historical data concerning all our inputs and outputs. So maybe let's start with a simple regression. So a regression that would only um, try to estimate the effects of costs on price. So this is, this is really you know, a simple example. It's not what we do in practice. We'll go to that uh, later on, but may, maybe let's start with that. So the first step, and actually I believe this is the case in all data science or maybe quantitative related projects is we need to start with an exploratory analysis. Because again, the model is as good as the input data to it. So first, and actually this is quite time consuming and it is a key step in all our projects. What we need to do is run that exploratory analysis and try to understand the relationship versus price and cost that you can see here on that scatter plot. And we don't only you know, graph the relationship between price and cost, that would be too simple. It would be great, but it would also be too simple. So what we do here is we ask ourselves a number of questions that help us uh, understanding that relationship. So, I mean, there is not a single set of questions that we need to ask ourselves, but here are a few examples. So typically, do we see on that scattered plot a relationship between price and cost? I would say yes. It seems that, and again, that is consistent with economic theory, the higher the cost, the higher the price. Second question is, is that relationship linear? It seems to be the case, so we can assume that it is, but that will be an important thing to check. Third question could be, how strong is that relationship? Because during that exploratory analysis phase, if we find or if we think that the relationship is not strong or not strong enough, we may not be able to capture it with our regression. And also, and this is, I mean, not on this scatter plot, but we know that running a simple regression of cost on price is likely not to be enough. So we also need to ask ourselves which other factors are likely to influence price, for instance. And then how can we estimate the impact of cost on price? So visually, we see that it is not such a simple question because the relationship could be this one showed here uh, with the red line, but it, it could also be this one. So still an increasing relationship, but not, 
not as strong as an increasing relationship. But someone could also, you know, have a look at that graph and say, mm, I disagree. It's not a positive relationship. It's not an increasing relationship. It's on the other end, a decreasing one. So we see that visual analysis, and fortunately for us, is, is too, too, too simple or does not allow us to estimate precisely the impact of cost on price. And this is why we need to stop at some point with that exploratory analysis and start the modeling phase. And <clears throat> this is where I'm actually going to take over. So as Antoine uh, explained, we think that the relationship is uh, actually linear between cost and price. So let's start assuming like this functional form. So we say then that the price is a function of our costs. And here uh, we have two unknown constants. So if we try to model uh, price as a, a line, uh, uh, we see that there are two constants. So there is an intercept, uh, beta, beta zero, and there's our slope, beta one. And those coefficients uh, and also an error term. So the, the difference between what we actually observe and what our model would actually uh, predict. And uh, given some estimates uh, for uh, sl our slope and intercept, we can start making predictions. So if we would take any values for beta zero and beta one, we can estimate the price and this estimated price is, would be our P hat, so our current uh, prediction value. So how this would look visually is actually we take our scatter plot and we fit a line uh, between it and our slope or our coefficient would be how steep or how flat such a line is. So this, this is uh, what uh, our model would tell us about the steepness. And uh, the constant or the intercept would be the point at which the, our line would cross our y-axis. So having made this initial prediction, uh, how, what do we do then? So we fitted the line and how do we know that this linear model is actually the best we can do? And this is where actually the least squared method comes in. So we need to establish a goal. So what we are actually trying to do what uh, is trying to minimize the unexplained part of our model, so the actual error term. So how, how does it look formally? So we can define the sum of squared residuals, so the difference between the actual observation, so our actual price, and what our model gives us. So uh, the difference between the first point and the uh, our model prediction. And we take a square of it because we are not interested in uh, if our model is uh, over or underestimating. We are just interested in the absolute terms, uh, absolute error our model is making. So having established that, uh, we can formally say that our problem is right now to minimize <clears throat> the gaps uh, that our model is making. So the, uh, the error that our model is making. So formally, we define a cost function uh, as a minimum of the residual sum of squares. So the differences between the actual point and prediction of our model. And I think it's, it's uh, important to underline the cost function approach since it's, it's a topic which you will see in, any, uh, in many of the machine learning methods that the you start with a cost function that you're trying to uh, uh, minimize. So you try to define a cost function and then you try to find the values that minimize such a cost function. Least squares is actually very nice methods, uh, very relatively simple method because it allows to solve it analytic. We can solve it analytically, but for the more complex methods, uh, you will fre frequently hear about gradient descent. So the algorithmic methods or algorithmic solvers that allow you to find those optimal values. But solving uh, analytically our minimization problem basically boils down to taking first order derivatives. So we try to find the minimums. <clears throat> uh, uh, so we take a derivative with respect to our slope and our intercept, and then we can show how uh, the relationship looks like or even estimate it already. So the analytical solution is relatively simple. So our uh, slope would be just 
uh, what we will need to estimate our slope is uh, the actual observations and the mean of the observations. So, uh, and, uh, and our predictor. And the intercept uh, kind of uh, also uses the mean and our slope. So, having said that, having it defined formally, how this idea actually looks in a, uh, in a visual form, because maybe it's actually easier to understand. So going back to our SCADA plot, so we fit our line, and now the idea is to find the error, to, uh, the error our model is making, so the residuals. And the residuals are, as I said, basically the distances between the observed values and prediction of our model. So we take all of those errors, sum them up, and try to find a line which basically minimizes some of so, such errors. And as I already explained, least squares is actually very nice visual method, uh, uh, very nice model, since the cost function we are looking at is actually a convex, really nice convex function. So we will be sure <clears throat> that we will always find the values for beta zero and beta one that minimize uh, our residual sum of squares in this example. So you can see it visually how we approach the residual errors and how we find actually the beta zero and beta one in this example that allows us to here to minimize the residual sum of squares. But this was a very simple example using just one input variable to predict our price. Let's <clears throat> now take a step to a bit more complex example like the multiple regression and actual application to our uh, work. Many thanks, Victor. So as Victor just explained, uh, the, the simple linear regression is, is too simple. Obviously, this is not what we do in our business life, but it's like, it's like the instrument that we play. So Victor presented the instrument, and now we will present to you the way we use that instrument, the way we play that instrument in our day-to-day -day life. So coming back to our, our job of estimating the alleged damages uh, in a cartel case. So in order to do so, we set the following functional form. And on that form, you will see many of the inputs we already discussed. So the costs, the demand, and the product characteristic to which we add a new variable, which aims to capture the effect of the cartel. So it's the D variable here. And the way that um, the way that we do so, same than for the linear regression, only now we need to do it for more variables. So we need to estimate more coefficients. Is again, we we can estimate uh, this coefficient as the value that minimizes uh, our error, basically. Um, yes, you can move on to the next slide. And so our D variable, which aims again to capture the effect of the, of the cartel is a cartel effect dummy. So it means that this variable equals to one for the period of the practices, so during, for the period during which the cartel was in place. So here in our example, we assume that the cartel went from 2002 to 2006. So it, it is equal to one during the period of a cartel and zero otherwise. So before the cartel and after the cartel, this variable is a zero. So then our model becomes the following at the bottom of the slide. It's actually two models. During the period of the practices, we add that dummy variable and we estimate that beta four coefficient before the cartel and after the, and after the cartel, that dummy variable equals to zero. So our model is more simpler. It's only the effect of costs, demand and product characteristic on prices. So this is uh, how our model looks like, but then again, uh, a visual representation of, of it may be simpler for you to, to understand. So uh, on the left part of the slide, you see that before, during, and after comparison of prices. So prices here are the dark blue line, and you see that the factual prices has been higher during the period of the cartel. And again, this is when, and this is something we wanted to stress out, our job, it's not only like producing the best model, it's finding a model that is, is, that is consistent with economic theory, consistent with all the evidence there is in the case. Some of them will be quantitative, some of them will be qualitative. So for instance, when competition authorities 
launch a cartel cases, it is because they have found evidence. It could be calls, it could be pieces of papers, or you know, meetings between the companies. So that's um, uh, graphing here the factual price we see, and we could uh, we could conclude, but it will be wrong that uh, the price overcharge corresponds to the increase of the prices during the period of the cartel. If we do a bit more, so if we estimate the counterfactual price, which would be uh, the following, we assume that price would have evolved during the period of the cartel as they did before and after. And here it's a light blue line. And we see that the difference between the factual price and the estimated counterfactual price could be uh, could be understood as corresponding to the cartel overcharge. Obviously, that would be too simple uh, of a model. So we need to we need to to add to that model some other factors that influence prices. And so typically, if we add the cost of production to our model, what we see here is the following. We see that similarly to price, costs increased during the period of the cartel. It has nothing to do with the cartel. It's simply simul simultaneous phenomenon. One is the cartel, the other one is an increase of, of, of costs. And so by accounting for the costs and the increase of costs during the period of the cartel, we see that our counterfactual price, which is basically the prediction of our model, uh, is a little bit higher, again, because of that increase in price. So that the difference between the factual and the counterfactual price, here the cartel overcharge, is lower, much lower, than what we would have and what we have in the left part of the slide. Um, so that's that's a way to do it, which is you compare the before period and the after period. This is one way to play the instrument. There is another way to play the instrument, which is a little bit more sophisticated, which is cross-sectional comparison. When we run a cross-sectional cross comparison analysis, what we do is that we compare the prices of the products that are, that are affected by the cartel, so here again in blue, to other sets of products that have not been affected by the cartel. And what we will compare is not only before and after period with the cartel period, but it's also we will also compare the prices of affected products and non-affected products. And the question is the following, what is the impact of the cartel that is specific to country A? So here we, we took the example of a country comparison, but there is also benchmarks that we can find to have a set of products which is non-affected by the, by the practices. So it could be prices of companies who were not involved uh, in, the, in, the, in the cartel. It could also be products of private label products if those were not to be um, in the cartel. So this is what we do, and visually, it looks like the, the following. So here you see again our blue line, and you see that during the period of the cartel, which is the left part of this graph, the prices were higher than, than after. But you see that this is the case both for the affected um, products, for the prices of the affected products, but also for the prices of the non-affected products. And so basically, in such an analysis, our estimation of the, of the overcharge would lead us to compare the price difference during the cartel to the price difference after the cartel. And the cartel overcharge is going to be the, the difference between the two that it is in a way specific to the period of the practices. And so here you see that taking into account both a comparison according to time and a comparison according to products, affected and non-affected, you get a more sophisticated and here reduced impact uh, of the cartel. And this method, we call it in our day-to-day -day life, differences in differences. And again, it's not specific to economic consulting. Uh, this is MC also a methodology that is applied uh, in the healthcare uh, industry, for instance. Over to you, Victor. So, uh, thank you, Antoine. Uh, so we saw which methods do we apply and like how do we actually play the instrument that uh, how Antoine described. But let's now take a step to the actual case, so to the real case and what what, what would actually what we would actually see uh, be the result of our model. So 
what you can see here on the slide is uh, the actual case. So it's a, a case that was uh, that the German Federal Cartel Office announced that there was a, uh, the, there existed a hardcore cartel uh, in a German cement market. So what FCO, so the uh, Federal Cartel Office, found is that large number of German cement uh, producers divided the uh, German market and, in, and implemented some quota. And uh, as a result, they uh, defined the cement producers uh, uh, for more than uh, 700 million euros. So what we see here is a uh, estimation table prepared by Center of uh, Economic Research uh, uh, in, in Germany. So what they tried to do is to actually estimate the effect of such a cartel. So our dependent variable is a cement price index. So it's a price variable. And uh, what you see in, uh, in such, uh, what you would see when conducting such analysis uh, is similar table to this. So first uh, part of the table is our regression results. Then underneath the table, usually you would see some regression statistics that allow you to evaluate uh, the model. And beneath the table, there are some guide, guidelines on notation. So how, uh, with, which are to help you understand what, uh, what, uh, what the person producing, uh, creating such a model uh, a bit more in detail. So what we see in this table exactly, so we have the cartel period, so the dummy variable that uh, Antoine explained. We have number of cost variables. So actually there are a number of inputs into producing a cement. Uh, and most of uh, most important are like lime, electricity and lignite. And there is also demand variable. So the cement production, uh, which uh, was assumed to be to approximate the demand for cement. So how do we actually interpret such results? So it starts with the coefficient. So the numbers you can see here are the uh, regression coefficients and how do you interpret those? So uh, one important thing to, to take into account when interpreting, uh, interpreting the coefficients is what units you are looking at. So sometimes in a, a regression, you can have dollar units or just absolute unit variables. Uh, in economics, we frequently use algorithms, uh, logarithms, and this is uh, why the interpretation of those coefficients are uh, gonna be slightly different than just unit, uh, uh, unit variable. But usually what you would see, the coefficients and uh, the regression coefficient will tell you how much change in price, unit change in price would impact the unit change in, mm, uh, so unit change in cost would impact the uh, unit change in price. But since we, uh, since this regression is defined as a logarithm of price and logarithm of uh, costs or price of lime, the interpretation goes into a uh, percentage change. So when focusing on the price index of lime, so uh, one of our cost inputs would interpret that 1% increase in uh, price of lime leads to 1.4 uh, to, to 4 percentages increase in price of cement, which uh, clearly signals that there, uh, the, 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 there is a certain relationship between uh, lime and price of cement. But what we are usually interested in is also cartel effect. So, and this is where the units uh, are very important because the cartel period is not in, uh, it, it's not represented as logarithm, but as a, a like linear unit. So this, this is why you need to transform it. But uh, using like, Small approximation. We can what we estimate, uh, what the ZEF estimated uh, in the regression is that during the cartel period, price of cement was twenty percent higher than mm, uh, than uh, uh, up, before and after. So moving a bit to the right, uh, we can see the standard errors. So those are usually numbers reported in brackets. Sometimes you can see them below the coefficients. Sometimes to the uh, to the right of the coefficients. And standard errors usually tell you how likely it is that uh, the effect that we estimate, uh, we see it by a chance. So, uh, so this is like very important in understanding uh, our coefficients because it, it, it is possible that uh, there is no relationship and what we see uh, as an impact of the coefficient, it was just a, 
chance. Uh, so those standard errors help us to actually understand the significance levels and they're very important. Uh, the significance levels are actually important in our day to uh, day job because this is exactly estimating uh, how we conclude uh, if in simple terms there was an effect or there was non effect. So we uh, see the cartel period effect by chance or the, uh, there was actual, uh, it is likely that there was actual uh, cartel overcharge. So frequently in uh, the significance levels that we take is 10 to 1%. So the number of stars represent the difference of the significance levels. And the most commonly applied level in social sciences is 5%. So what the 5% means is actually the risk of concluding that what we observe, uh, that there was, uh, so there is 5% risk of, uh, uh, of uh, seeing that there was no actual difference in the results. So uh, we, we take this as a assumption. And uh, the last Im important part in uh, uh, maybe the last, uh, Part of the table, which which can is also very important, is the R squared. If so, I may, and this, yes. If, there, if I may interrupt, I would like to go back to the significance of course. these coefficients, because okay, here is how what we do matters. To be honest, so in such a model, uh, we would find that the all things being equal, the cartel has led to an increase of prices by twenty percent, and twenty percent is a lot. And this model could be used, would be used, will be used by companies who purchase cement from the from the cartel uh, participants, and they will go back and you know uh, said basically we have buy, we have bought uh, cement twenty percent higher than we should have we should have because of the cartel. So there will be some some damage cases uh, before the court. So here in Germany, by which these companies would. would will basically ask for money because again, they would have paid a cement a higher than they should. And so 20% is a big, is a, is a big thing. Um, and this is why the significance level is very important because if, if you, it's really not the same in terms of um, the robustness of our, your analysis. If you say, okay, the cartel has had an impact of 10, 20%, but you know, there is 10% chance, chance that I'm wrong or it, has an, it had an impact of 20%, but there is only 1%, the name wrong. In terms of how this model and the results of the model are going to be used before the court for companies will ask for money from the cartel participants, this significance level is really essential. Thanks, Victor. No, thank you. Uh, this, this is actually a very important point uh, that we are paying close attention to. Uh, so going back to R squared, so this is the measure that allows us to evaluate how, how good is our fit of our model. So R squared usually defines the proportion of the, uh, uh, of the variation that our model explains. So here is 72, uh, we would, would indicate that 72% of the variation in, our, uh, in the data that we observed is actually explained by this model that was uh, uh, that, uh, that is estimated. So, but I think it's important to understand how our, our R square is constructed to actually be critical about it and also <clears throat> uh, understand like what it exactly evaluates. So the R square composes of two components. So the first component, which we already saw and which is the underlying uh, uh, very important for the least squares. So this is the residual sum of squares. So this is the difference between what our model predicts and the actual observation. And so this is uh, yeah, the residual variation and the total sum of squares. So this is uh, the variation that uh, we see in the data itself. So this is the difference between observation and the mean of uh, all, uh, all observations. So the P dash uh, represents the, the mean. So what R squared, how R squared is actually defined is the difference between the total variation so it's a ratio between difference of total variation and the residual variation. So the unexplained variation of our model. 
So you can see that the R squared actually, what it says is uh, it tells you the total variation explained by our model. However, it is important to understand the disadvantage of R squared is that the more variables we include, the higher the R squared can be. So we can include a lot of variables which bring no value to our model and our, uh, they can still, by chance, uh, increase the predictability of our model. So R squared is usually defined between zero and one and the more variables you include, so the R squared can improve or so it's weakly increasing. So the more variables you include, it can have no impact on R squared, but most likely it will have like very small impact. And this is why uh, frequently you would see uh, when analyzing the regression result, the adjusted R squared, which tries to impact, uh, which tries to account for this uh, flaw in R squared, uh, taking into account the number of coefficients uh, you include in your model. So having this functional form with smaller number of coefficients would uh, could have an impact. And this, this is the goodness to fit, which would help you to basically compare different models and compare uh, your, your results. And I think this would be the most of uh, all what we uh, wanted to uh, tell you today. And I think I give, uh, uh, so Antoine, Sorry. So we hope that it was interesting to you. We tried to find the good balance, and hopefully it was good, between theory and you know business application uh, in, your, in our day-to-day -day life. So we hope uh, you like it. Maybe before we end the presentation, a few uh, concluding remarks. So our job is about finding the, the good model and it's the good model according to us this is not specific to our job this is specific to everyone who work uh, within quantitative uh, role uh, and so typically data science uh, are related but to us in in the context we work on a good economic model is the following first as we discussed as a matter of introduction we need to consider both prediction and interpretability and in the cartel case overcharge example, interpret interpretability is at the core of what we do. Again, because we, ask, we are asked by clients, by competition authorities, and by judges, a simple question, which is, did the cartel has or did not has an impact on prices? In order to, to respond to that question, we need to include all relevant explanatory variables. So obviously we need to account not only for the cartel period, but also for all other factors that are likely to influence price. These variables that we include in our model, when we estimate these coefficients, this coefficient needs to make sense uh, in terms of, you know, both the context and the, the evidence of the case and the economic uh, theory. So again, if you were to have a model in which cost has a negative impact on prices, this is weird. And you will be asked question by other economists working on the case, by competition authorities and judges about why do we have this odd relationship between the two. It's actually the same for the cartel prices period because the assumption, the, yeah, the, the assumption of a cartel is that companies sat together to agree to increase prices. Agreeing to, in, to decrease pricing would be a little yeah, a little bit worrying. So if you were to have in your model, and if you were to come back to the competition authority and said, actually, the cartel has had a negative impact on price, that is possible. And it happens uh, on cartel cases, but you will need to have strong argument to, to defend your position. And it also must be well specified. So we talked a little bit about significance. If you say, okay, the cartel has increased prices by 20%, all things being equal, but that I'm 80% sure of, this is not enough. And this is not enough for competition authorities to take court decision, legal decision. Um, so it's all about significance and also R, R squared, which as Victor explained, is basically the, 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 the quality of your model. So this is the criteria we use in order to come up with with what we believe to be a good model. But because our work is about finding that balance between economics and statistics, 
we would say that there is not a single good or a single best model that everybody will agree on. So in our day-to-day -day job, we have debates internally, but also externally on what is a good or the best model. And you have to remember that this model, you know, as, as good as it is, it is only one piece uh, of, the, of the case puzzle, which is made of all the relevant facts, quantitative facts, like the model we talked you through, but also qualitative. So again, many thanks for joining that session. We hope it was interesting, not too long, not too theoretical, not too practical. So basically, we hope we like it. And we also hope that we will have the chance someday to meet in person rather than over Zoom. So thank you very much, uh, all. Thank you.